I'm delighted this afternoon to introduce the performative research body, Public Movement, and its core members, Dana Galumi and Elena Katsov. Public Movement were invited to the Guggenheim to provide a corporal response to the exhibition, But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise. I have been a huge fan of their practice since I was introduced to them a few years ago. They have been interrogating the collection, interrogating the exhibition, and providing a very interesting response to the central theme of my exhibition, which is geometries. And in relationship to geometry, the body plays a very central role. Those of you who have seen my exhibition have seen firsthand how geometries and ideologies of architecture permeat almost all areas of what is known as the contemporary Middle East, but also its formation during the modern epoch but also the way in which nation states have also been constructed. I have curated the exhibition much akin to a, a jigsaw puzzle, and I'm very much interested in the way that public movement have come in to the project and reformed it, reassembled histories, particular what I like to call jigsaw histories. Um, they have been commissioned for a long-running performance, Debriefing 2, which premiered several months ago at the start of the exhibition. And Debriefing was a one-to-one -one performance in which public movement and its agents interrogated art, questioned art that was made in Palestine before the advent of Israel prior to 1948. And as part of a mini residency that the artists performed here in New York, where they were made available to archives and curatorial knowledge, public movement were able to really go through the bowels of the Guggenheim, particularly in relationship to key historical moments, the formation of the State of Israel, but also an important key date, the 1967 Israeli war, which is a very important historical point that ricocheted, that had a domino effect throughout West Asia and North Africa indeed. So I'm very much interested in how they've come in as agents, as interrogators, bringing knowledge, but also smuggling ideas, ideas that are you know, opaque, sometimes transparent. It's been very rewarding. Particularly choreographies of power, those of you that were here yesterday evening who witnessed that firsthand, I mean, I still have ripples every time I think about that artwork, how important it has been to bring together another language, one that incorporates several layers, history, performance, but also this dynamic encounter with the audience. Public movement are very much engaged with creating this idea of what a movement constitutes, a whole idea of moving, this whole idea of moving in fluidity, elastic ideas, ideas that are very much in tune with what decoupling as discourse really uh, encompasses here in New York, here within the museum. Decoupling, as I've mentioned several times, is a process of something moving away from the center, but not necessarily sethering its ties. It remains autonomous on its own account. And that's been something very interesting in working with the performance group. Obviously, the exhibition and its mandate was first to bring in acquisitions into the collection and then to curate them. So the freedom that the public programs allowed was tremendous, and I do applaud my colleagues in public programs and education for their hard work, as well as my curatorial colleagues. Public movement, in addition to their work here in New York, are well documented in terms of their performative strategies. Recently, they staged a new uh, performance at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Prior to that, they were awarded the prestigious um, your Future Generations Artist Prize in Kiev, in Ukraine, and also took part in the new museum Triennial Ungovernors. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce them now and invite them to the stage. And following their uh, discussion, we will engage in a three-way conversation. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to uh, begin today in my role as the Director of, of Strategy and Protocol within the Performative Research Group, Public Movement. And I want to begin by fulfilling my role as the Director of Strategy and Protocol with some thank yous um, on both my behalf and on Dania Halomi's behalf, the Director of Public Movement who's standing to my right. 
Um, these thank yous are not just the typical thank yous, they're not rote. We want to really thank Sarah Raza for the invitation to come and make a new commission within the context of her showing at the Guggenheim. There's really a very fortuitous and exciting meeting of ideas, especially within this idea of contraband that you mentioned in your introduction yesterday, and some, the notion of smuggling ideas, and we're really grateful to be working within that framework. I want to especially thank um, Christina Yang, and Joan Young for their absolutely fearless and um, incredible, incredibly enduring support of our project, which I, for those of you who don't know much about our work, hopefully you'll have a better sense of how much labor it takes to pull off some of these projects um, and how much it asks of the entire team of the museum. And we really felt uh, an incredible wind at our backs throughout this entire project. So we really want to extend a sincere thank you and of course to their exceptional team, uh, Jennifer Yi, Amara Antila, Alan Sees, Laili Ameli, and Sarah Maleka. I've butchered all of your names and I hope you'll forgive me, but know that they are extended with the most heartfelt thanks. And I know this is a very long thank you for a short talk, but we really did feel that it was um, imperative. And before I move on, I also really wanted to thank all the members of the curatorial staff, custodial ta staff, technical teams, uh, the people who work in uh, the painting storage where we were allowed to go visit and visit with some of these um, incredible paintings and works of art that have embedded within them the kind of conflictual and contrasting modernist constructs that we're going to look towards uh, unpacking a little bit in our brief presentation today. Um, Donna and I were invited here to talk a little bit about our working methodologies. So we're going to very explicitly um, break down a little bit about what public movement is, how we've approached a couple of our recent projects, and how that led us to the work that we did here at the Guggenheim. So that you understand a little bit of where we're coming from. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of images. I'm not going to name them according to project type, but just to give you a little bit of a visual sense of how we work. Um, as I mentioned, Public Movement is a performative research group. We investigate and stage political actions in public space. We use constructs like civil pilgrimage, the right of return, nation branding, civic bodies, the choreography of protest, and museum collections to raise questions about nationality and heritage. A key public movement strategy has to do with the concept that politics exist within our bodies as an often dormant knowledge. What that means is that as part of our research practice, we study and create civic choreographies, forms of social order, overt and covert rituals. We explore forces and formations of identity and systems of movement that, that govern the dynamics of public life. One of the central questions that we've been asking, especially since the beginning of the project, is what can you do in a group that you can't do alone? So as Hannah Arendt said, one can only act politically jointly, not in isolation. I would like to, um, in order to be able to enter to the museum, I will take a few minutes just to explore our methodology as it, um, as we practiced it in the past, um, the first seven years of our practice in public movement. Um, so shortly to, um, get you into the world of, of public movement. Um, I'll use this example, Cross Section, which was created for the Future Generation Art Prize in, for the Pinchuk Art Center in Kiev. Um, our, we don't have a, um, a bank of actions that we can repeat again and again. Every action demands from us uh, local research. Um, we, arrive to, we arrive to a place, uh, to a, um, an invitation, a little bit like, like social scientists, and we try to understand where are the where are the conflict lies, where is the trauma, where is the unspoken or underneath like um, waves of, of either unrest or solidarity. I'll use the, the Kiev story just as a, a very recent example in which we arrived to Kiev roughly half a year after the revolution um, when they overtook power from Yanukovych and then shifted into um, pro-European governance. And this action was created in performance because we are creating live events, but I think we were also trying to 
to think in which ways can we commemorate a revolution that is still ongoing, or how can we participate in a creating a ritual in a process that hasn't yet ended. And in Kiev, what we used is, um, a, is a, what we call civil pilgrimage, uh, a phenomenon that we have explored since 2006, 2008. Uh, we worked very closely with Dr. Jackie Feldman, who um, studied mainly youth, Jewish youth trips uh, from America to Israel and from Israel to Poland, in which he, under, he, he describes these um, processions, or this, sometimes they last seven days or ten days, as a theatrical moment, or a very long theatrical moment, in which when you are going through it physically, you become a carrier of the history that you went to visit. So you become physically um, engaged in, 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 in agency of knowledge, but also in an agency of experience. And um, we organized um, a walk that lasted one hour uh, between two major geopolitical spots in Kiev, trying to bring together both the um, movement of violence and compassion that, was, um, that took place there uh, in the past year, but also try to understand in which way can we um, experience together, but also try to form uh, an idea of identity that is still in flux, that is still shifting. Um, and in that sense, I also want to, to mention um, Elias Canetti um, in um, Crowd and Power. When he talks about the moment in which you are you, in, in order to become part of the crowd, you have to um, dismantle some of your differences and especially the physical elements. So when you're moving together, you're moving not always by the rhythm that you choose. Um, you give up on, on a certain kind of um, um, desires or wishes or comfort in order to become part of the crowd. And um, I think that those kind of processions um, taught us a lot about um, how can we create a common identity. And, the procession has been a methodology that we used several times and entering into the museum uh, was a very um, interesting shift because we always thought about procession as something that happens in public space which is outdoor to the museum. And entering into the museum, um, let me show some images before we move on. So entering into the museum was um, not a natural step for us. Um, after seven years of every, in every invitation, dragging the museum back to the square, to the street, um, to where we um, thought about very vivid uh, space or arena for politics to perform themselves, um, then there was, a, there was a moment in which we entered into the museum thinking through um, a very historical moment um, through the French Revolution, 1792 and the storming over the Louvre. So there is this very uh, beautiful painting. I think it's in our, it it's a little, yeah, yeah this one. Um, it's painted in 1796 uh, by Hubert Hubert. It's called An Imaginary View of the Louvre in its Ruins. So it's actually painted after the revolution. Um, but I think that part of um, the way we were thinking through this painting is thinking into the revolution, into the first public museum that was ever created, which is the Louvre. So in, 19, in 1792, um, there was a moment of um, storming over any points of power um, in Paris and in France um, to try to physically overtake the sovereignty from the king. And the Louvre was, of course, like a, a very important point to um, that a lot of the a lot of the people, the citizens, were trying to take and the, the revolutionary um, uh, organization created revolutionary guards to um, make sure that people don't storm the Louvre to take the paintings with them. Knowing already, although they did it in every other location of power, knowing that the, this collection will be at the heart of the new identity will, which will be formed just after the revolution. And, and indeed, the Louvre is open, open to public, I think, in 1793. Um, and 
has become um, kind of the, 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 symbol, the symbol of sovereignty. So, and there was, there was a, the distension between the revolution and this, the, the discipline that they needed to, to take on them while they are um, in a moment of destruction somehow. So there was this need for a leap between um, old order to new order. And it's interesting that even in this moment there was, there was a, a, a careful thinking about um, art and the relationship between art, citizenship, collection, and museum. We recreated this uh, painting, a reproduction, as part of the National Collection exhibition, which uh, we will start to speak about very soon as an example to what we understand today um, is the source of the publicness and the movement of the public inside museums. So staying back in time just for a quick moment, I want to remind us about some of the questions that came up last night in the keynote. Um, these ideas about contested histories, um, regions and nations as constructs, as, as being rooted in a kind of colonialist paradigm. And to, to temporarily uh, locate, I'm just going to go back to this slide, which is of the Crystal Palace, um, locate this moment in exhibition history, which Tony Bennett writes about a lot in the essay called The Exhibitionary Complex, where um, through the colonial moment and out, coming out of the process of industrialization, um, and in fact, in Europe, as was often mentioned in the conversations today, exhibitions become a mode of, of knowledge distribution. And more so, they are actually critical in shaping the very concept of something like national heritage, which is at the time a relatively new construct. It's a new way of organizing identity and organizing the law. Um, these relationships were often crystallized through the World's Fairs, which tended to feature exhibitions according to nation states. And so not only are we learning about the museum as a site through the exhibitions and the World Fairs, um, but they actually become a training ground for civic behavior, meaning that right at that moment where, where the populace, where the civic body is en masse learning how to encounter, look at, and be around exhibitionary display, the body and the human, the, the populace or the civic body is learning how to perform a kind of democratic function. So that the exhibition space is actually training, training the civic body on how to behave. This is significant for many reasons, but not least of all because we understand that commemorative ritual can build political solidarity even in the absence of ideological consensus. So what, my, what I mean by this is that the, the commemorative ritual of, of understanding how we move through large, large public spaces, the process of stopping to look and understanding that you're being watched is part of creating a bond that even supersedes a sort of a shared ideolo ideology. And that's how we begin to build a relationship between um, exhibitionary processes and national identity. Um, Nav referred earlier today to the myth of na the national monoculture. This is exactly what we're referring to here, right? Is how, how the idea of a monoculture or a national monoculture is built through exhibitionary processes and therefore through a, a kind of choreographic process. And just as a, as a historical note, um, there was a Lithuanian sculptor who was named Boris Schatz who exhibited at the Exhibition Universelle in Paris in 1900 and then in 1904 he saw the construction of the Bulgarian Pavilion in St. Louis. Um, and we bring up Schatz because Schatz was actually the figure, he was the person who proposed to the Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland and, and convinced them to build a school for Hebrew folk art in Israel in 1905 or 1906. So we're, we're looking at how this this figure, this artist who was very influenced by what he saw through the world's fairs and came to understand as an explicit relationship between culture and the formation of national identity and then appropriated that very early in the process of Zionism and of the Zionist project. Um, this, of course, reaches a, a kind of phenomenal peak when the declaration of the State of Israel is made from within the Tel Aviv Museum of Art in 1948. So what we're looking at is a kind of lesson of performativity. And of course, um, as Rashid said earlier, there, there is this moment where the establishment begins to use culture to support 
the, the kind of constrictive developments or this, this sort of institutionalization of power. And I think that we can really um, look to this performative moment within museums as a moment where this relationship of power is congealed. And at this point, maybe it's worth just saying quickly that uh, in terms of our collaboration between Donna and myself, that we understand this body of work that's come out of the last five years or so of collaborative thinking as a real meeting between choreographic and curatorial practice. So the ideas that are generated are coming through a kind of meeting of those worlds. Yeah. yeah. Um, a very um, big project that we did together and is really um, a mark in the, in the shifting into the museum is National Collection. It's an exhibition, that performative exhibition that took place in Israel exactly one year ago and um, a very inaugurated moment that um, initiated the entire exhibition, but also I would say public movement, and it's in our own history, is the declaration of the State of Israel from within the Tel Aviv Museum of Art in 1948. You can see on your left, um, Ben Gurion. You can see the, the, some of the paintings already, you can catch um, in the frame, declaring the State of Israel. Um, in 2007, so almost 10 years ago, when public, a few months after public movement was established, we went to the, what is today the Independence Hall, and we uh, put down a leaf of flowers um, to take upon ourselves, or so to mark this moment in which we um, will continue uh, the, 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 the very um, connected moment between art and politics and the performativity of politics um, as it is in, in the day-to-day -day life. Um, and actually not in museums, but then then we found ourselves here anyway. The picture on the right is from 1958, um, 10 years after they declared the state. Ben Gurion was really uh, trying to figure out how to mark and celebrate the 10 years anniversary. And of course, as a Soviet educated, um, he, he wants to create a reconstruction of the declaration. Um, the, they often um, mix and make like mistakes with the with the photos and use the wrong photo from 58 to uh, refer to 48. But actually, you can see a few ladies in the first row um, that would never be there in 48, but they are the widows of the ones that were sitting um, in 48. And we were looking at this uh, very performative moment, taking I would say the first performance in the museum of Tel Aviv, and trying. And now these two institutions are separated. Um, the Tel Aviv Museum is in a different address, although from 1932 until 1971, they were united. Uh, the first two years uh, after the declaration of the State of Israel, the museum also served as its parliament. So after the hour when they closed at six, then the politician entered and they um, voted on things. And we wanted to bring back these two halls, the halls of politics and the halls of, um, of art, to the same location. And this is... Um, when we take a lesser Uri painting from the Independence Hall, it's the painting that was on the right of Ben Gurion, and march it to the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, through, the, um, through Tel Aviv, and place it there in the reconstructed Independence Hall that we created inside the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. And this was the departure point for this exhibition that was investigating different ways in which the politics and the codependency between the state and the museum still perform itself today. Um, I'll just give one, la one small um, example. I mean, more than the fact that the Tel Aviv Museum is, is across the road from the main Tel Aviv, huge um, military base that is in Tel Aviv, the biggest. They are sharing a proximity of um, geography, but also, for example, um, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, when they, we were very interested in the moment they enter into an emergency situation and the way they protect the, the paintings and the artworks and how in some way this emergency procedure create um, a core um, national collection that would stay in a, in a case of emergency because of course not all of the paintings will go down to the shelter in the same priority. So there is a categorization of paintings that they need to create in, in a moment of danger. Um, and we succeeded getting this information over like plenty packs of cigarettes with the head security guard. Um, and finally learning through some curators that were, studying, that were working there for years and, and have experienced um, the war with Iraq in 91 uh, in which this, um, this emergency procedure was activated, but also the war in 2006 with Lebanon and the war, the, what they call operations in Gaza uh, in 2011 and so on. 
Um, I mean, we're, we're going to, in a moment, talk a bit more about um, how we come to find ourselves then in the Guggenheim's collections and museum, and hopefully we'll be able to address this much more during the question and answer period. But I did just want to draw one very important idea, which is that there is a kind of similar modernist arc or arc of modernity that exists through the, f the foundation and the design and building of this museum as a structure and as a building, um, and also the formation of the collections that coincides with this moment, this modernist moment, this kind of peak moment of modernity. I'm gonna come back to that, and Donna's gonna come back to that soon, but what I wanted to first um, address is the other piece that we have running here um, right now at the museum, which is called debriefing session. Um, what we've found is that when we generate large projects like National Collection, I think there are a couple more images here, um, what tends to happen is we collect a lot of research. It's a very extensive research process. And it often involves a lot of backroom negotiations, discussions, conversations, and things that are sometimes um, the people we're working with would rather we didn't announce. And also, some of the material isn't a totally appropriate for large-scale choreographic practice, um, either because of its content or because of how dense it is or how rhetorical it is. One of the things that we just found through a project we did in 2011 here in New York at the New Museum called Salon's Birthright Palestine? Question mark is that sometimes the material that gets left behind can be the most politically potent, and it's a it's a situation that I think a number of artists deal with. That sometimes the material that you can't quite shoehorn into becoming a work of art is actually some of the material that you wish you could sit with the longest um, and that you wish you could share the most. And so we developed debriefing sessions as a methodology exactly to address this kind of material. So in the case of National Collection, which was the exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, there was a, a kind of parallel research process in which we were learning about paintings made by, by artists living in Palestine, um, the paintings that were made before 1948. Um, so examples of modern art made uh, in Palestine before 1948. And we found ourselves unable to find a way for it to make a kind of cohesive sense within the exhibition, but felt that it was material we really wanted to share. And so we share it um, in debriefing sessions, which we've, we've named after the term debriefing, which originated uh, in the United States Air Force at the time of World War II, because for the first time, pilots were um, being sent out on missions on their own. There wasn't a commanding officer there in the plane with them. And the military needed to come up with a way to get information from what had happened happened, and they needed the officers to feel like for that moment they could report exactly what had taken place without fear of repercussion. So if a commanding officer had accidentally fired off uh, a weapon, they needed to understand exactly what had taken place in the field. So the idea or the framework of a debriefing session in militaristic terms is a, a moment where you're giving an actual play-by-play -play of the events as they took place without analysis. Um, so we've, borrow we've borrowed that term as a kind of conceptual framework for the debriefing session performance, which is um, always a one-on-one -on -one performance. Um, and it's, it's always, so it's always delivered by a public movement agent to one singular individual. Um, and the public movement agent we often refer to as a double agent uh, for reasons that maybe we'll address more in a moment. Maybe just to say about the adaptation of debriefing session into the Guggenheim Museum and also the ways the debriefing session um, continue to exist not only in the performative form but also in a, um, in a form of a book, uh, which is a manual. So it's a manual for people to train and become agents of uh, debriefing session and by that creating more agents of information. So this is a book that we published uh, last year with Sternberg Press. And I think that for for us, we find often in the adaptation that the stories that, 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 that are unfold through the briefing session are actually stories that are very vivid within the collection and the museum also today. Um, and choreographies of power was also a way that we could continue um, understanding deeper and deeper the mechanism that are um, used in, in the history of museum, but also in a current, um, current conditions. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I just um, wanted, maybe before we, we wrap up, to just say that the, the debriefing sessions look explicitly at the relationship between national identity and um, 
and cultural institutions. So the way that we call the information or put it together and the way that it's delivered is meant to demonstrate the ways that systemic violence or the way that certain forms of violence are absorbed by institutional practices through archives or collection building. Um, any, any kind of um, collection or uh, cultural practice that has an eye towards creating a sense of national identity can often be intentionally inclusive or exclusive. And one of the um, strategies or ways that we use the debriefing sessions is to demonstrate the ways that previous actions ac activate or um, create tension with or rub up against current politics. So the idea is that by giving an account of our research, um, rather than just giving a lecture presentation about art made in Palestine before 58, but rather by really giving an account of the research process, we demonstrate the ways that certain um, systems are still in place. This may be what I wanted yeah. to say, in that adapting the piece for the Guggenheim was a very special process. Yeah. yeah. And we hope you enjoy both new pieces. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you Thank you both of you for the wonderful presentation this afternoon. What has been most striking for me within your practice is this exploration of semiotics this interrogation of order, whether it's civic order, whether it's more covert, this strategy is fascinating. I mean, utilizing signs, signs that perhaps sometimes are not visible to the naked eye, others which we are more familiar with. Could you speak a little bit about that? Because I feel that that is something that is very strong and connecting within your practice and how you've translated that, obviously from geography to geography, history, modern history to the contemporary. So perhaps you could speak about this a little bit, please. When we started public movement, um, I mean, in the past 10 years, the, the, the strategies and the themes that we are, phenomena that you are looking into, were ne there was never like a master plan. It always, every project created the next project or the next exploration. Um, and when we started, we were, we, we really we wanted to become the body of the state and the body of the citizens. So we were busy um, training the, past, the, the first three years um, with state institutions, with military services, with um, um, police, firefighters, and, and so on, but also with activists and with a resistance group that um, uh, conduct a very um, thorough um, training of the body. And I think that the the way that they are used around the world, there, are, there is this phenomenon of quoting. You often quote from something you see. Um, and there are also a, 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 what we call dormant knowledge that is in your body, that you know that once you, for example, shout the same, the same word or lift the same hand at the same moment, um, you become a united body. And looking at, at the ways that this is performed in public spaces, but also the ways that it's performed in a museum, was somehow a natural development through time. Okay, thank you. And um, perhaps in terms of that, because you started off with the very public processions, streets, parks, squares, and obviously now to interrogate the museum space became very interesting. Obviously starting your interest in painting, for sure, was a starting point. Then you obviously mentioned Crystal Palace as well, how the exhibition became a site in itself of display, of commerce, of culture. So all these interrelated, interwoven ideas are very important. I want to uh, push you a little bit on this because I know that through both debriefing and also through choreographies of power, you interrogate certain artworks from the modern period and they almost function like protagonists of sorts. They become protagonists within this artistic narrative that you're building, because obviously you're telling a very contemporary story, but you're not southering the past either. It's very alive. And that's something I want you to speak a little bit about to kind of unite that concept. Sure. I mean, I think, I think part of it is that there isn't always a clear delineation between the past and the present. So what we're interested in are um, following the stories, the narratives, uh, the points of friction that actually give us insight into some of the problems that we, that we experience or encounter today. So in other words, understanding the ways in which some of these stories from the past are actually still active. 
And so we, we, we were surprised as we were digging through the Guggenheim archive, which was a really exceptional experience, and we didn't know what we would find. And it was really quite astonishing, actually, to begin to follow um, various different threads of activity that, that gave us insight into larger geographic movements. So, for example, the fact that Saliba Duahi's painting was hanging here in 1967 when the Six-Day War was taking place is, it's more than just coincidence. It has to do with migratory processes that are taking place in the early 60s as people are leaving Lebanon and moving to the United States and the, the drive to be organizing a Middle Eastern exhibition, which is where the painting was initially hung and then purchased through a collector through a New York gallery and donated to the Guggenheim. So looking at the ways in which there are um, trajectories of, of um, there are political trajectories that are somehow embedded within the paintings if you dig through them and you begin to think about um, how they function not only as works of art in and of themselves but as almost evidence, evidence um, for, for movements, ways that they've traveled or ways that ideas travel and how we can um, tease out or try to deal with complex ideas in the present tense by exploring those historical moments. I think that's very interesting because I often find that it's quite a nihilist idea to kind of cut off the past, but with artists that I'm working with, especially those who are from the diaspora or related somehow to the region, they relate culturally or for other reasons, there is, there is that active kind of correlation with the past and active interrogation of it, which is very interesting. But in terms of your work here mm. at the Guggenheim, do you feel that you came in through the front door or the back door? <laughs> because a lot of ideas, you know, a lot of the research, those of you who have experienced um, choreographies of power or debriefing, debriefing isn't rooted in the Guggenheim's history. It's more in relationship to the formation of modern art or the absences of modern art in what is now known as Israel. So it reflects upon the state of Palestine as well. But in terms of your work here in the Guggenheim, it's very interesting because you're bringing in two different kinds of ideas. You're first working with a, a modern art collection, a collection and a building that you know, represents a kind of secularist principle uh, of modernity, of culture, yet bringing in certain elements. And I know that you were aware that, you were, that we had a coincidence, a lucky coincidence that we both share an interest in uh, contraband, in smuggling, in ideas around visual culture that have yet to gain uh, further attention, especially those opaque areas where we ignore thinking that there's no value there. But that value system is something constantly that we seek to explore and uh, exchange through transactions, through cultural transactions, whether it be actions or whether it's through script or so forth. So perhaps you could speak a little bit about you know, whether it was a front door or back door policy, because I know we joke about this, but something a little bit more that allows our audiences to see the kind of coherent circularity in what exists between the choreography, the museum, the paintings, this public movement, we often say we don't take a position, and I, not just for the sake of being difficult or contrary, but I do think that it's both. I think that part of the role is, you know, the book is called Double Agent, and part of the idea of, of the double agent as a methodology isn't about like a cinematic idea of a double agent. It's not about um, a romantic idea or a provocateur, but actually about the ability to come in the front door and the back door. That's why there's two of us. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there's a little bit something to that, that, that actually we have to work both ends. And in order to understand the political spectrum, you have to be willing to ask the same question of many people, even if you think you might not like the answer and also different questions of the same people. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe just to add one more thing is that um, I think this is also a strategy. Like you enter very proudly through the you know, main entrance, um, you march in, but actually what you're bringing with you is what would be discussed in the back room area. But um, the fact that it's placed and staged in a very... Um, Say integral way, um, as if this is this is the front, um, is also a strategy. It's a strategy to engage us and also the, the viewers in in stories that we considered as um, um, how should I say like they are not clear politics, but somehow they if if you follow and this is what you said about like the interest in in paintings, we are interested in paintings, but we are actually more interested in their movements. 
were interested in the movement in, of paintings and how, if you follow their movement, you follow politics. What is also interesting, thank you, Dana, is what you said earlier on about the dormancy that lies within the body, mm -hmm. the gestures. Like, if we think about it, a very popular gesture is that of the fist, you know, the raised fist, which is becoming more and more increasingly another kind of emblem, if you like, for another kind of civil movement. And you employ certain gestures and certain uh, kind of bodily components that perhaps are lying dormant or those that are suppressed somehow. And then how do you rework that within this kind of public body which public movement represents? And then again, there is that aspect of the people that follow you, the audience that follows you along this procession. I mean, how active are they within this kind of semiology that you're creating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's a very interesting question because there are many um, um, levels um, to who is perform what. You, you can say if, even in, in choreographies of power, there are public movement who are the th six um, you know, members wearing white uniform and they are performing what we, movement that we recognize. In, in a way, I also want to say that we, we don't, thinking about choreography is not thinking about inventing movements. We don't invent any movement, actually. We are, we are copying and placing and, and creating new compositions of, of very known choreographies, very known set of movements. One public is public movement, then there is the other performers who are the performers that came to see the action and are being viewed by the general public who came to the museum. So suddenly they see not only us, but actually us plus 16 other people marching through the galleries or doing something together. But then also there is like the third like performers somehow, or the performers of the museum. So all the general public that suddenly we are looking at them moving and, and kind of manipulated by our movements and how they react and how they interact with us and with the paintings and with the, you know, one another. Well, that's very interesting, the whole idea of cultural transaction that takes place with the kind of, let's say, covert and overt participants that are part of this layered process. But coming back to the script, because I know that as part of the performance you initiated and wrote a script that you researched, uh, Elena, you did mention that initially you were not sure of what you would actually find mm -hmm. in terms of the archival knowledge, and we made both archival and curatorial knowledge available to you with our collections curators. You visited our storage, for example, as well, and several paintings were incorporated. But perhaps you could speak about that process, because obviously this isn't an art historical narrative, mm -hmm. and that's something to uh, consider, that you provide an artistic spectrum. You provide a very specific vantage point from which to discuss both uh, the formation of modernity and obviously its double-edged other more violent side if you like mm -hmm. so perhaps you could speak a bit about that sure i would be happy to it, it was a really spectacular process i mean really we began very open-ended and by that i mean um, donna was here for 10 days in may and together we had our first archive visit and we familiarized ourselves with um, the way the Guggenheim Archive is organized with the help of Gillian and Joan. And um, we began to uh, think about how to enter into looking for something. I think, I forget who, maybe it was Ariela Zulai who said this once about the archive, that you can't search for something that doesn't have a meta metadata. Or maybe it was Joan who said it. John, was it you? No. <laughs> Somebody said this, and it really stuck with me in the last few months, this idea that you can't search for something that doesn't have metadata in the archive. So if it hasn't been input, you can't search for it, which is why one of the many reasons why there are large absences in the Israeli military archives, for example, because it depends how you label something. So given our interests and what we're looking for, which is a kind of juicy stories, places where the institution has had to modify itself because of an activity that took place, um, situations where laws have had to change, times where, where uh, some kind of engagement through public space, through politics, has forced the institution to yield, is what we're always most interested in. And so we began with a very broad search. Um, and when I say broad, I mean really quite broad, like looking up um, any kind of possible connection with the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, for example, um, looking up uh, idea, p sort of a history of the Cold War, when, when uh, there was a quite large project through the CIA of sending paintings abroad um, and as sort of a form of American propaganda. 
um, digging around to try and learn about the fire that happened here in 1967. I just realized I'm telling all these stories publicly. I hope that that's okay. They're your reading of them. So. They're our interpretation of them. Yeah, exactly. And we, we began, what would happen is we would do the research and then we would speak on a daily basis and discuss um, things we were learning about Hila Ribe, about Peggy Guggenheim, Solomon Guggenheim's sister, uh, about various uh, exhibitions that had happened over the years, uh, time moments where certain works were acquired into the collection or gifted to the collection. Um, and we began to read about Thomas Messer, who was one of the directors of the collection. And then we would start, we would just begin talking and we would look for overlapping threads and trends and ideas that might help, um, help us come up with an idea for an action. And in the end, there was something really provocative for us about this relationship of this idea of collection building as a secular activity, as a non-objective activity, um, and, and the premise of the MAP project as a whole. And we were very invested in trying to bring some sort of connectivity or connection through your show into the history of how the collections here were built. I think that was a fascinating summary because especially for those who are not so familiar with the research practice that took part, the research component was extremely strong and that obviously informed the actual gestures and the choreography that took place. But Dana, can you speak a bit about as your role as a director, how some of the moves you, clearly you adapted them from previous performances. You mentioned that one work informs the other, but here you were able to bring, it was an opportunity where you um, took elements from the performance from the Tel Aviv Museum, how you overlaid that here, you also brought in that painting, a reproduced painting of the lesser work, which was important <laughs> to point out here, that was a reproduction of a painting. So you have this kind of one ideology directly atop of another and then layer that again within the exhibition. So perhaps you could speak a little bit about that because we do start from But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise and then we somehow go through then the history of the institution, we go through the, um, we go back in time. So there's a of shifting and zigzagging going on. We go back into the modern period and then somehow we are then projected back into the future. So perhaps kindly say a yeah, few words. Yeah, sure. Um, it was a very, it's a really nice description actually of, um, of what we're trying to do with this procession. I would say that Lesser Uri became almost like a, like a gesture that maybe, you know, that might even repeat in the future. There is, um, um, it's the third reproduction, and one, one lesser Uri is now hanging in the Independence Hall in Tel Aviv. Another, because they don't have the original, because they're not a museum, so they don't have the conditions. And then the, another one is at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, who decided that they decided that although they have the original, they are going to keep the reproduction um, also in their uh, collection, which is also, I find, a very interesting decision. And then the third one here um, in the Guggenheim. And I think this, the, the painting also carries, of course, what we, what we is embodying a lot of the um, moments in history that we are referring to, but also this uh, collusion between art and politics, but maybe also the, the way they work together. Um, I, and, and I would say that although we are traveling in time, I would say again, that I would stress the 1967 as a year that um, many... Um, Incidents were happening around the world, incidents of movement of artworks, major waves of immigration, um, riots, uh, unrest. Um, um, so it, it doesn't only come from the Middle East to United States and Europe, but also happens in Europe. For example, we mentioned the 67 towards 68 student riots. And, um, but we then also take um, a very big shift back to 1925 when we are reconstructing um, a collection of movements that were developed um, by uh, doctors in Germany. Um, it's uh, taken from a, a video, a film called uh, Ways to Strengthen Beauty. And um, this is a collection of um, training exercise uh, to um, overcome the, the um, um, the new labor, so the, the new worker who is much more engaged with machines and doing repetitive um, movements and how to still keep its body uh, open and healthy and, um, and, and powerful. And these uh, movements um, were trained at the beginning by um, youth and, and mainly, um, I would say, uh, uh, mainly in Germany and, and connected to nature, but also became later on part of um, 
a very strong national identity. So those, those are actually what we perceive as the movement of modernism. So what is the modern body and how does it move? How should it look like? And how two movements are united and creating together geometric forms, mm -hmm. which is really the max, like the, the top of the top of united um, movements and, and bodies. Absolutely. It's a very interesting summary. But also now I'd like to open it up to our floor and our guests here this afternoon. Those of you who have not had a chance yet to experience uh, choreographies of power, we do have uh, four performances this Saturday, three on Sunday, and also debriefing this weekend, Saturday, as well as final debriefing next weekend, which also comes uh, with the close of the exhibition on the 5th of October that same week. Uh, perhaps I'd like to ask a question to our audience, maybe our curatorial colleagues who have worked so uh, hardly and so so uh, diligently on this project about disclosure. You know, there was always this negotiation, this dance of sorts about how, what we can disclose, what we cannot, how we can, you know, negotiate knowledge, particularly imparting curatorial knowledge, knowledge that is, uh, you know, perhaps private to some extent. You know, what is made public is a very specific language. Perhaps we, I would like to ask one of my colleagues, maybe Joan Young to, say a few words, if she wishes. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I might say, I mean, it was fascinating, the archival research that they did that actually brought to light events in the history of the institution that our, most of the curatorial staff wasn't actually aware of. So it was fascinating to be learning more about our history. And they were also some very sensitive moments in our history. And then grappling with how does one discuss those, um, that part of your, your past. Um, and how in the effect that it's had then on the present. So, um, so it, was actually, it was a great learning experience for, <laughs> I think, many of the, the team here too, so. <laughs> Thank you. Charlotte, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, so um, one of the things I kind of took away from learning about the UBS MAP project was that a lot of it's also about like making acquisitions and growing the collection in kind of different areas of the world. But I was wondering, um, I know this work was commissioned, but um, will it be acquired in kind of any way? Because it is so unique to the New Times history, obviously this iteration of the work couldn't really work any place else. That's a fantastic question. That's something I'm working on. But in terms of uh, oh, yeah, acquisitions, uh, how the map has functioned, the map is now closed, you know, in yes. terms of its current phase. But we continue our commitment to the artists and that we have other uh, collection committees which we will be presenting works for. There's been a great interest in the work of public movement. It's such an important, interesting contemporary take on our history of the institution. It's very much rooted in the institution as well. So obviously that's a discussion that we're going to be obviously taking very seriously and taking it forward. But also more importantly, it's the relationship that we've built with these artists. Regardless, they've made a historical moment and what are the beauties of the performative qualities is that it's ephemeral, it's somewhat temporal. Those that have been fortunate to go on the journey with public movement, our staff, but also those that take part in the processions also are departing with a knowledge, with a, with a new knowledge that really there isn't any value on, that's something that has to be experienced. But of course, for sure, it would be a dream to have public movement in the Guggenheim's <laughs> collection, and we're definitely thinking of ways that we can make that possible. Well, since I'm being recorded, I, at least I'll say that I think that would be an excellent idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions for Dana, Elena? Thank you. Well, then I'd like to thank you all for your patience this afternoon. I do apologize that we started a little bit late. Thank you for hanging in there with us and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>